Woods. I've also been saved, I was saved five years ago in the Murphy Pond. Um, I'm involved here with the R, with R and R Ministries. I'm going to Guatemala this summer with them. Um, I love to play basketball. I have a passion for it. You know, I'm trying to find a way to connect other people to God through that. Um, also, this morning, we'd like to invite you to worship the Lord and Savior with us, both in reading and in music. So let's all stand together. All right. Thanks, Cooper. Well, you're, you're in the right place to worship. You really are. So let's, uh, let's find some joy and worship the Lord. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave, my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise.
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the for for being here lord you you came you stayed in the presence of your holy spirit and you're coming again and we are so looking forward to that day lord but lord until that day i pray that we would be found faithful that we would uh, just take advantage of your new mercies every day to start over and to live for you in a more powerful way than the day before i pray god that you would speak to us through your word today that you would touch us with the power of your holy spirit and that we would be the believers you need here in Eagle Point and beyond, Lord, in 2023 to reach this world in a way that has never been reached. God, I pray that, that we would live faithfully and that people would ask us about the hope that's in us, that is in us, even in this hopeless, cynical, negative world, that they would see hope and joy and peace in us and know that there's something different and we could have the opportunity and the privilege of sharing, them, sharing with them the good news of you. So, Lord, speak to us today and, and just get a hold of us in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Good morning and Happy New Year. My New Year last night looked a little different than, than my New Year's of many years gone by. I celebrated New Year's East Coast time and was in bed by 9 o'clock. <laughs> and it was good. <laughs> you know, I remember as I was growing up and just kind of wondering, every time we'd celebrate New Year's. So what does God think of us celebrating New Year's? Because, because God doesn't age. And I think God sees time differently than we do as he lives in eternity. And we're growing older. But I also think he's mindful of our frame and our limitations. And he needs... He, he understands our need to mark time as we are getting older. Sometimes just in my private thoughts, a few years back, um, we had a granddaughter that, that, that went to be with the Lord. And when our kids put her in my arm, they said her name was Faith. And I've never forgotten that. And I've always wondered, how old will faith be when I get to heaven someday? And what will she look like? But you know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'll recognize her. And she'll recognize me. Not just because we can see each other, but because we know the character of one another's hearts. But I could give you an idea of how old I think she'll be. No guarantees here, but I think she'll be around 33. 33 because, well, that's how old Jesus was when he went to be with his father. And I can remember being 33, and so can you. And 33 was pretty good. <laughs> it didn't get better than 33. Will there be babies in heaven? Or will, it, will, or will there be just one age? The Bible doesn't really tell us. It does tell us this, that we'll be with Jesus. And it's not going to get better than that. But if you were to ask me how old we'll be when we get to heaven, I would probably say 33. So happy new year. And just by way of announcement, next Sunday, I believe it's the 8th, 
a Charlie Grenade is going to be here at 7 o'clock, and he's going to be sharing with us um, what it's like to be living in the marijuana culture that we are today. And I know I, I plan on being there. I'd like to find out more of what he has to say. But you may want to share that with friends and family so you can be here at 7 o'clock. Mike said I could share in Matthew this morning or um, do my own thing. Wow. You know, what an open door. It's the beginning of a new year and he's not here. (laughs) Have you ever wanted to make a difference? You know, as we get older, sometimes I think we just kind of want to blend in and say, what's the use? But I think, I think every one of us can probably remember a time when they wanted to make a difference with their lives. I remember Becky and I asking our son, Nate, who just flew out to Norway last week, you know, what he wanted to do. And he said, Dad, I want to make a difference. He believes it's still possible to change the world through the power of Jesus Christ. I think there was a time when we all felt that or we all wanted to do that. Some of you can remember back to January. It was 1961. We were watching our black and white TV sets and uh, John F. Kennedy had just accepted the office of President of the United States of America. And he fired up our patriotic veins with these words when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So can one person really make a difference? Can they change their culture or where, they're, or where they live? Can we make the world a better place? Well, we, we all pay our taxes, we vote, we obey the laws or at least try. We would be willing to defend our homes and our country and that's all well and good. But haven't you ever wanted to do more? I think our country, the United States of America today, is struggling to spiritually survive. But you know what? It's not from being underdeveloped. It's not from poverty. It's not from poor sanitation. It's not for starvation. Only I heard there was a prediction in 2023 that they were going to finally get Americans off red meat. Um, You know, whether that'll happen or not, probably won't happen in my household, but they may... They may try. I think ours is a struggle. America's is a struggle for the heart and for the soul. Sin is, is spreading through our, our towns and our nation's vital organs. Parents are really no longer parenting or don't know what it looks like because they're confused. Families are falling apart. Immorality today, regardless of where you look, even the commercials on TV, is made to look good and becoming the new norm. The more crazy it is, our world, the more fashionable it's become. A person's word is no longer their word and not what it used to be. Our cultures, our cultures view of truth has changed. It's not what it used to be from when I was growing up. And if it's changed, what can really one person do? And how can we make a difference? And we, we may want to try to blame it 
on somebody's political agenda or what's going on in the White House. But I don't think that really has anything to do with it. Individually, you and I, we the people, must turn to God. I think I shared with you the other day that I'd been taking some time in Psalms and in Chronicles. And in Psalms 100, I think it's verse 3, it says, it's he who has made us and not we ourselves. He's designed us. He knows the way that we're going to work best. And so he's given us the truths of his word to live by. And one of the things he's told us is that we're to pursue our first love. Think about the loves that you have in your life. You can find your loves just by thinking about what you desire in life or what you want the most. Where do you spend your time? What do you think about? And you can find what's important to you. I believe Jesus told John about the church at Ephesus that they had lost their first love. On the Sermon of the Mount, it's in Matthew 6, that Pastor Mike has taken us through. Jesus said simply in 6.33, seek Seek me first in my kingdom. Almost 700 years ago, before John Kennedy celebrated his ascent to power, another young ruler was reveling in his accomplishments. It was Solomon, the son of David. He had just completed the temple that his father David had only dreamed about building. And Solomon's craftsmen were now putting the last stones into place. There'd, there'd been a beehive of workers. But now it's all ready. And they're ready to fill the house. They're ready to worship the Lord. And while the king and the people were making sacrifices and welping, getting ready to welcome God's glory into the temple, and as the priests were carrying in the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies. As some of you were worshiping this morning, you were, you were lifting your hands to the Lord. That's what Solomon was exactly doing. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I know you're familiar with verse 14, but I'd like to take you through the chapter. Because you see, the temple is getting ready to be dedicated to the Lord. So if you'll open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, I'll start by reading verses 1 through 3. Now when Solomon had finished praying... By the way, that's where making a difference starts. Come, it, it all begins right there. It's when you pray. Now, now when Solomon had finished praying, the scripture says fire came down from heaven, and this is a literal fire, and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And all the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and they gave praise to the Lord saying, truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. And I want you to notice there where it says his loving kindness is everlasting. And you may want to count how many times that it, it says that throughout this, throughout this chapter here. And it all started with prayer. Because prayer gets God's attention. The worship, the sacrificing, it went on for days. And it peaked with what the Bible says down in verse 9, 
that was a solemn assembly. A solemn assembly was, well, it was a time of prayer, worship, and sacrifice. In this case, a solemn assembly was for dedicating the temple of the Lord and the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was going to be brought into. There's only a few places in the Old Testament where you read about a solemn assembly. It's when the temple is being dedicated or the people of Israel are remembering the feast that God told them to remember or when they were dedicating themselves to the Lord. I kind of want you to hold on to that because at the end of this passage of Scripture, I, I want to try to show you what a solemn assembly would look like for us today, according, according to the New Testament. I'll tell you what. Um, let's go to Psalms. Psalms 119. I want to look at verses 2 and 10 because it's going to go along with what a solemn assembly looks like and how we can make a difference today. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies. The, the testimonies here, it, it's referring to God's word. And then it says, who seek him with all their heart. Drop down to verse 10. With all my heart, I've sought you. If we want to make a difference, it's, it begins with prayer, but we need to seek the Lord with all our hearts. Desiring him more than all all else. And then the scripture back in Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, we're going to read verses 4 through 10. The king and all the peoples offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep, Thus the king and all the people dedicated the house of the Lord. The priests stood at their posts and the Levites also with the instruments of music to the Lord, which King David had made by giving praise to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Whenever he gave praise by their means, while the priests on the other side blew the trumpets and all Israel was standing. Then Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered the burnt offerings and the fat of the peats offerings because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not yet able to contain the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat. So Solomon observed the feast, the feast you're going to see here goes along with a solemn assembly. At that time for seven days and all Israel with him, a very great assembly who came from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. On the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly for the dedication of the altar and they observed seven days in the feast, se seven days. Then on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their tents, rejoicing and happy of heart because of the goodness that the Lord had shown David and Solomon and the people of Israel. If you want to make a difference, and I believe one person can make a difference today in the world, it starts with prayer. It starts with seeking after the Lord. And the 22,000 oxen, the twenty. The 120,000 sheep. But, but you know, even if it had been 22 million oxen and 100, 120 million sheep, it wouldn't compare to the sacrifice 
of the Lamb of God who is to come. People have told me as I look back down through the years um, that they tend to cringe when the Bible talks about all these sacrifices that took place in the Old Testament. But you know what the Bible's doing? It's really painting a picture. It's showing us the seriousness of our sin and how great a price that Jesus would have to pay for our salvation. Solomon had designed the temple to be a place where God's holy requirements were met. He did this at great expense, and the people came and they worshiped. This was one of the pinnacles of Solomon's life. And he's making a difference for himself, the people, the nation, as he followed after and sought after God. It's a way, you see, some people, especially as we get older, we stop trying to make a difference. We don't think it's possible anymore. But I'd like to renew your confidence and show you from God's word how it really is possible. And you don't have to be a full-time missionary or a full-time pastor. You don't have to wait until you're out of high school. We can all make a difference with where we are in life. And as the weeks of worship and sacrifice and feasting were coming to an end and the crowd started to go home, I think Solomon was ready to bask in the afterglow of the music that was in his mind and remember the fire, that holy fire that had come down in verse 1. And then without warning, while the king rested in the darkness, there was a visitor that came to his room. There was no one else around. And the Bible says, the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night. It says that in verse 12. And whenever you're studying the Old Testament and you come across the word Lord or the word angel of the Lord, it's usually referring to Christ incarnate. Some scholars might call that um, a Christophany where you'd see a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's, let's read it. Look at verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and he said to him, get this. He said, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself. Wow, it was just God and his man together in the stillness of dark. And during this encounter, the Lord talked about his temple, the people, and Solomon himself. And it all started off when the people started to pray. Prayer gets God's attention. And his prayer, I firmly believe, as we look into this new year, that will get God's attention today. It's really quite an affirmation that we're reading about here. And the Lord wanted his house, or his temple, to be a place of sacrifice, praise, and worship. He wanted the nation to remain faithful to him. And, and it's when we remain faithful that God can use us to make a difference. Just last Friday, I met with Chris here, and we were sitting in those two front chairs, sharing our lives and talking, and, and we were praying. And I said, wow, Chris, you know, it's, it's been years. It's been decades that we've been praying together and walking these streets, praying for revival, and praying that we'd be faithful men. And I told him, I said, could you imagine what it would have been like if, if you were unfaithful to your wife, or I was unfaithful to my wife, or our wives had been unfaithful to us? As, as the church, we are called the bride of Christ. 
the bride of Christ. We want our brides to be faithful. God's been faithful to us. He wants us to be faithful to him. And when we do those simple things, when we pray, when we seek after him, when we're faithful, it sets us apart from the world. And people notice. Why would they notice? Because nobody's doing that anymore. They're trying to remove prayer. Did you hear about that lady in England, I think it was just this past week, that was outside an abortion clinic? She wasn't holding a sign. She wasn't marching. She was out on the curb and she was praying. That's all she was doing. She was just praying. And she was cuffed and led away. Just for praying. When we pray, when we seek the Lord, when we're faithful, we're making a difference. And the world's going to notice. The people, they had just dedicated themselves to the Lord. But God knew that in the days ahead, I mean, can you imagine witnessing what they did? the fire, the holy fire of God coming down and Solomon and what he experienced with the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ right there. But even still, God knew that the people might start drifting and the people of Israel did start to drift away. But think about our roots and where we've been and where we've come from. My goodness, have we started drifting away. So God was going to test them. And it was going to be in the following ways. Verse 13 of 2 Chronicles 7. The Lord's, this is right after the Lord appeared to Solomon, verse 12. So if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, among the people. Drought, famine, pestilence. How would they survive? The people of Israel were going to endure the consequences of their sin. And I think America today is going to endure the consequences of our sin. And we may ask, the same question. And the answer that God gave and is going to give Solomon in verse 14 right now blows across our own culture and generation and it should give us hope because there's a pattern here of what we can do in verse 14 to make a difference and to get God's attention. And I believe not only change ourselves and our, that of our families, but that of a culture and a nation. And I think it can, it can happen with one person. I still believe that. Maybe that's not your experience. But I, I believe. I believe it. Some of you have memorized this verse, but it'd be a good verse to underline. There's a formula here. Get the formula. Again, this is what Solomon was to do if the people of Israel started to drift away from the living God. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I, I God, will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. I think this passage of scripture tells us that we as God's people, we have a responsibility in the culture and the society in which we live. 
We were put here for such a time as this to make a difference. I really believe we were born today. This generation for a reason. Even as Esther, Queen Esther. Remember the story in the book of Esther? The word God, it's never even used. But you see the providential hand of God on every page. Remember the story? Um, Esther was a Jewish maiden that became queen to King Ahasuerus. Well, the villain of the story is a guy by the name of Haman. And Haman wanted to destroy all the Jewish people. Satan was really using him because he was trying to destroy Messiah. But Esther had an uncle that was a dad-like figure in her life by the name of Mordecai. And Mordecai came to Esther. And at that time and in that culture, it was, it was wrong for somebody to go before the king without being summoned. And to go before the king, even if you were the queen and not summoned, you could be put to death unless the king called for you. So Mordecai went to Esther as all the Jewish people looked like they might be put to death because of Haman. And Mordecai said to his niece type of daughter, he said, Esther, you need to go before the king. And you need to pray for the lives of the Jewish people in your own life because he doesn't know you're Jewish. And in chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai says something to Esther. He says, who knows but that you haven't risen for such a time as this. This is your time. And Esther said that she'd be willing to go if her people would pray. Not just pray, but fast. Because she knew her life. She was putting her life at risk by going before the king unsummoned for such a time as this. You're all familiar with Hebrews 11. That's, we call them the heroes of faith. But you know, the last time I read that chapter of the heroes of faith, they all had feet of clay. They were all sinners. The only thing that distinguished them was their faith. That they were men of women of prayer. But now they're with the Lord. And you may not have thought of yourselves as a hero of faith. But we're here for such a time as this to make a difference. This is our time. Someone just reflecting on being with someone last night at a, a gathering. They asked me if heaven has portholes or if those that have gone before can see. And everybody has their own thought there, but I have mine too. If you go from Hebrews 11 to Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, since we have such a crowd of witnesses watching us from the grandstands. Who are those witnesses? Come on, man. They're the people of chapter 11. Are they watching us? I'd like to think that as my mother is part of those witnesses, the Lord keeps her from seeing some of my blunders. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> but does he let her see the times that I'm on my knees? I think so. Yeah, I think so. So how did I get off on all of that? <laughs> because we were put here to make a difference. And we are the heroes of faith today. We just don't think of ourselves that way. Because we're such screw-ups. But that's what grace is all about. I was talking to you about that just Friday. Grace.
So what have I learned the past six months? That I've been (laughs) semi-retired? I've learned a lot about grace. And that I'll never be in heaven someday without it. I know I have this much faith and God's given this much grace. And it's really all about him. And it's not about me. And he wants to use us to make a difference. And if you ever feel like our country today is spiraling out of control or turning from Christ, well, the Lord has put us here. He's put the church here. And he said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against it. That we could be light, we could be salt, we could bring healing. So how can we personally then champion our faith and truth and make a difference today? Well, from verse 14, we can see that God expects four things from us, his people, if we're to make a difference. And again, I just really believe beyond a shadow of a doubt within my heart, if any of you older saints have stopped trying, well, you need to look up and see the Lord and believe he wants to use you to make a difference. Um, It starts by humbling ourselves. And you can put that up if you'd like right now. There's an outline here. There's a format of how we can make a difference. From verse 14, humble ourselves. You see it right there in scripture. You don't even need to look on on what's going to come up. Secondly, you can pray. Thirdly, Seek his face. Fourth, turn away from wickedness. It's all from verse 14 in the scripture. You say, what's wickedness? Well, that will probably be different for all of us. Let the Holy Spirit show you what wickedness is to you. Israel's past inheritance was not going to be enough to save them. And neither will ours. Maybe you've come from generation after generation of believers. But that's not going to save you. These people would need to turn to God and humble their hearts. And change their actions. And in return, God promised that their prayers would get his attention. Prayer still gets God's attention. The scripture says that he would hear from heaven. He'd forgive their sin and heal their land. I know I've said this over and over and over again. But I want you to remember. Prayer gets God's attention. And we can make a difference. If you'll go back to the Psalms with me. Go to Psalms 117. I recall it's a very small psalm. Maybe just a couple verses. Here it is, just verse 2. Are you there? Psalms 117, verse 2. For his loving kindness. How many times have we read about God's loving kindness in 2 Chronicles chapter 7? For his loving kindness is great towards us. I want you to get this. And the truth of the Lord, the truth of the Lord is how long? Somebody say it. Yeah. Truth is everlasting. It doesn't change from generation to generation. It hasn't changed from Solomon's day to our day. People, whether it's through what we listen to on the radio or the advertisements we see on TV or wherever you go, people are going to try to tell you 
what truth is today. And that's why it's so important that we come, that we have this assembly. Are you putting it together yet? (laughs) Think, people. Could this be a solemn assembly? We'll talk about that as we go. But we need the truth of God's word. Because we're being lied to. As far as what truth is. God never made a covenant with any other nation but Israel. But since we as Christians today are called God's people, called by his name, we can claim this promise. If you look on at verses 15 and 16 from Chronicles, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. The, the, the temple was an inspiring cathedral. It was a place where people could experience God's presence. And centuries later, after Solomon was gone, Jesus himself respected the temple for its original purpose. It was to be a place of prayer and a place of worship. Now turning from the temple and the people to his leader, the Lord showed Solomon how his walk alone could perpetually influence the whole nation. And how I believe we individually as Christians and as Christ church can make a difference. As we pray God's agenda. God's agenda is seen in 17 and 18. And as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, even to do according to all that I've commanded you, and you keep my statutes and my ordinances, he's saying do it, do it this way. Then I will establish your royal throne as I've covenanted with your father David, saying you shall not lack a man on the ruler as a ruler of Israel. What was God's agenda? What were the people to do? They were to obey God's word. And then the Lord revealed the negative side if they turned away from him and didn't keep his commandments. And he said what would happen in 19 through 22. But if you turn away and you forsake my statutes and my commandments which I've set before you and you go and serve other gods and you worship them then I will uproot you from the land which I have given you and this house which which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb and a byword among the nations. As for this house which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to the land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook the Lord, because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them from the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this adversity Upon them. So, what hand would Solomon choose? One contained images of greatness of he, his sons, and his grandsons sitting on the throne of Israel. On the other hand, he saw darkness and being uprooted from their land, the temple in ruins, and God's people suffering. Reproach because they didn't obey what the Lord said to do. What was going to be their destiny? It was going to depend on Solomon's desire to walk with God, to serve him, and to keep his commandments. As you see in your Bibles there in verse 17. And you say, well, Dick, our, our situation, it may be different from that of Solomon's. And it's true, the United States, it is in Israel. And we live today under grace and not law. 
and God's spirit dwells within us rather, rather than a temple. It's true, but the principles here are the same. Like Israel, we as a country have enjoyed God's blessing for over 200 years. And perhaps the, re- the reason for that relates in part to our purpose, our original purpose of government. Because it was based on biblical values and biblical standards. But as a nation, we've drifted far from our former commitment of being one nation under God. Which makes me wonder, could we as a nation, that is the United States, be forfeiting God's blessing today? Let me ask you something. Please ask yourself the question. If God were to pay you a visit tonight, like he did Solomon, what would he say to you? What would he say to me? You know what he's been saying to me all week long? To me? Humble yourself. Pray. Seek my face. Turn from wickedness. This is the pattern for making a difference. You don't need to go to another country. You don't need to quit your job and do something else. Stay with where you're at. I don't really even think you need to move. You don't really need to move to Idaho. (laughs) I won't go into that. Just make a difference where you're at. We were here this time, this place, this location to make a difference. And if you don't think you can make a difference, you've been looking in the mirror too long and you forgot to look up to a great God. There's healing in this simple message this new year as we individually seek to make a difference in our world in our families. Do you pray together as a family? If you believe in the power of prayer, you would. You can make a difference. Where you work. By praying, by following, by seeking, by being faithful because the world's watching I don't really think it's going to be done by a committee it's not going to be accomplished in the paneled rooms at Capitol Hall it's not going to be done in judges chambers it won't even be done in voting booths it'll be done by we the people by the church Go back to verse 14. By my people who are called by my name. By Christians, you and me, who love God with their hearts, their minds, their souls, and their strength and want to be a good neighbor. And people forgot what being a good neighbor looks like. When I see the crime that's happening within our own little rogue valley than the people that stand by and do nothing. I get really angry. The responsibility, church, we may want to point to what's happening in Washington. I think it starts right here. We can make a difference by praying for ourselves and our country. 
and thinking bigger than we do. You can't just look at this life. You have to look into eternity. It starts with the attitude of our hearts. And if our hearts are not in the right place, well, true change isn't going to take place. If we as Christians are doing our own thing and just blending into the culture that's happening around us, we're going to look just like Israel of old. And how can God hear our prayers and forgive our sin or heal our land if we just want to blend in? We were never meant to blend in. As a corporate body, we get to take communion this morning and spend some time in prayer remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. So ask God the Holy Spirit to mirror your own spirit, showing us any sinful attitudes within our own lives that may be limiting God's power in us from make it, making a difference. And let's remember the steps that God gave Solomon for a blessing in their lives and their land by humbling themselves, by praying, by seeking his face and turning from wickedness. We can do that individually. We can do it for our country as we step into this new year. We can humble ourselves before the God of all creation and pray. I told you at the beginning that I'd try to show you what a solemn assembly would look like in the New Testament. And I, hint about, I hinted about it when I talked, to, talked about our assembly here and the importance of it. So if, I want you to see it for yourselves. So if you'll go to Hebrews You that love the word, you know where I'm going. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to look at 24 and 25. How can we create a solemn assembly today? And we've probably been doing it a long time, we just don't realize it. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. The scripture says, not forsaking our own assembling together. It starts right there. People say you don't really need to go to church today. There's some truth in that. In the truth, in that the church will not save anybody. It's only Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. He said there's salvation under no name, under heaven and earth, you can be saved except the name of Jesus. But you know what the assembly does and when you come to church, you hear the truth. You're not always going to hear the truth out there because truth out there is always changing. Truth in here, according to God's word, it never changes. Not forsaking, you're assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more As we see the day drawing near. The day drawing near is referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. When we assemble weekly and we pray and we worship the living God. We stir up one another. We need one another to love and good good deeds. We're able, as the scripture says in verse 24, to encourage one another. If you're not going to church, you're probably not growing. Are you going to be used to be, is your life making a difference? Probably not. I'd say you're just fitting in. We were meant to grow. To grow is a command according to Peter. To grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So we need to pray that we would individually this year make a difference in our families, our community in this next year, asking ourselves, and I want you to do that during this communion service, is Jesus really my first love or what's got in the way? We were put here for this time to make a difference. Think back to what we've just studied. As Solomon was dedicating the temple in a solemn assembly, we can dedicate the temple of our lives. You see, it says in Acts 17 that God doesn't dwell in temples made of man-made hands. The scripture says clearly in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 that we are the temple of the living God. Can we have a solemn assembly here this morning? I believe we're doing it. As we dedicate the temple of our lives. As we make him the worship of our hearts. As we pray. As we seek. As you take this time, you know, In the Old Testament, the Jews, they had their feasts. And the feasts were to bring the people together and help them to remember. Because they were so forgetful. And the Jews, over time, wanted to blend in to what was happening around them. Just like we're doing today. Jesus gave the church, not really two feasts. But he gave us two things to remember. One of them was communion. And he said, to do this in remembrance of me. Remember my death, my resurrection. And then he said, I want you to do it until I come. He said to take these simple elements of bread and juice that represented his body broken and his blood shed. There's power in that. You may have not thought a time like this was a solemn assembly. But I think it's what it looks like. And it's what we pray from our hearts. You're right, you can't make a difference. But the Holy Spirit of God living in your life can help you make a difference. And he wants you to make a difference. Because we're here at this time for a reason to build the kingdom of God. It's not about our kingdom. So as you take communion this morning, thank the Lord Jesus for his sacrifice. For grace, for forgiveness. It's really all about him. It's not about us and what he can do through us. Repent of your sin. Ask him to help you this week to make a difference. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in this assembly, be glorified in our lives. Forgive our sin. Right now, we would just seek you in prayer. Forgive us of being caught up in so many other things or being sucked in by the culture in which we live. Thank you that there really is ultimate truth and that you are the truth. May we turn from our own wickedness and help us to be faithful to you. Thank you for your amazing grace in our lives. Help your people to be able to catch it this morning. 
that they are, we are the heroes of faith today. And we were put here for this time in this culture to make a difference. We thank you for this communion you've given us to remember. Use us for your kingdom, Lord. Thank you that we're going to live forever because of what you've done. Now help us to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of you, the Holy Spirit. To be observing the sacraments you've given us like the Jews did the feasts of old. You are God and we worship none other. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I would invite you to stand. And as we sing, feel free to come up when you're ready and get the elements. And then uh, eat and drink on your own as you feel ready as we worship. You are 
are my God, you are enough, Jesus. I give you my life, I give you my trust, Jesus. Take up my cross, Jesus. For you are my God, whatever the cost, Jesus. Jesus. My heart is yours. My heart is yours Take it all, take it all My life in your hands My heart is yours My heart is yours Take it all, take it all My life in your hands Take it all, take it all Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was great. Jesus 
could not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the boast of sin and grace The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory I remember last fall being given the opportunity with soccer kids to uh, both you, John and I and, and others of you and, and you, Robert, but to uh, give a devotional or pray with kids um, from all over the city here. And some of didn't know how to pray or hadn't heard about Jesus. And, and so I was able to show them how to pray. Even though they didn't know how, I would tell them, just repeat after me. Um, one of my favorite characters in Scripture is the blind man. Remember, Jesus touched his eyes. I think it's in John 9. And the Pharisees, or the religious leaders, remember they came to him and said, how are you healed? And I loved his simplicity. He just said, I don't know. All I know is that I was once blind and a man named Jesus healed me. I don't know. Would you do me a favor? I'd like to lead you in a closing prayer. But I don't want you to think of yourself as too old. Go back just to being a child with me for a minute. Because I pray, pray those kinds of prayers the best, just from my heart without thinking. So pray this prayer with me, would you please? Great God, you're the eternal God. Thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. I humble myself before you now. I seek your face. Forgive my sin. Heal our land. Use me to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.